and the first person I find giggling is going to read the scripture next time. <laughs> the Apostle Paul's writing to the church in Rome, and he's writing this letter that's well thought out. You know, a lot of times Paul would just write these letters and psh, just send them off, you know, quickly. Uh, and I think sometimes, uh, you know, he didn't spend a lot of time drafting those letters. He was getting information here, information there, but this is one that he spent some time writing. He thinks a lot about what he wants to say. He's deliberate in what he has to say. And the Apostle Paul, as he comes to the end of this letter, the, church, the letter to the church at Rome, he just wants to say thanks. And he wants to say, hey, say hello to some folks for me. Say hello to some folks for me. And I wish these people had real names, you know? Well, two of them actually do. But uh, they're names from the distant past. Names of people that, well, we haven't met. Probably never will. But important people. People in the life of that early church. Beginning in the 16th chapter of Romans from chapter, uh, verse 5 through 13, we hear these words from Paul. Hello. To my dear friend, Eponidas. He was the very first Christian in the province of Asia. Hello to Mary. What a worker she has turned out to be. Hello to my cousins, Andronicus and Junius. We once shared a jail cell. They were believers in Christ before I was. Both of them are outstanding leaders. Hello to Amplonitis, my good friend in the family of God. Hello to Urbanus, Urbanus, our companion in Christ's work, and my good friend, Stasis. Hello to Apellus, a tried and true veteran in following Christ. Hello to the family of Aristobos. Hello to my cousin Herodian. Hello to those Christians from the family of Narcissus. Hello to Tryphena and Tryphosa, such diligent women in serving the master. Hello to Persis, a dear friend and hard worker in Christ. And hello to Rufus, a good choice by the master. And his mother, she has also been a dear mother to me. And one was named Rufus. We've been working our way through the book of Acts a little bit in a sermon series that Pastor Andy and Pastor Bill and I have put together. And we continue that, that march through Acts and remembering the, what was going on in those first 30 years after the resurrection, after the resurrection of Christ. And I read this morning to you, we're actually backing up a little bit. I read to you from the third chapter of the book of Acts, verses 1 through 10. And we hear these words. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and a man lame from birth was being carried in. People would lay him daily at the gate of the temple called the Beautiful Gate, so that he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold. But what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. Immediately, his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God. And they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to them. This is the word of God for the people of God. And for that we say, Amen. Amen. God. Acceptable in your sight. You are our strength. You are our rock. Our redeemer. You are the wind beneath our wings. You're everything. In Jesus' name, Amen. Okay, boys. It's time to get up. 
Your mom ever say that to you? My mother had a way of, of saying, get up, that could make the angels smile. Ronnie. She called me Ronnie. You can't. <laughs> Ronnie, it's time to get up now. She could say that oh so gently. But my mother could also say get up with a little edge to it. There were moments when my brother and I knew that we'd been laying around the house long enough. That we'd been curled up in bed on a Saturday morning long enough. My mother could say get up in a way in which we knew that there was another imperative just lurking over the horizon. <laughs> Or else, who says that? Yeah. Get up, or else. My mother had a way of saying, "Good up, get up." That could either put a smile on your face or terror in your heart. <laughs> this passage from Acts this morning records a story, a story of a healing that took place near an entrance to the temple. Two of Jesus' followers, their name Peter and John. They're headed to the temple for worship and they stop to help a man, a beggar. He's sitting by one of the gates. He's lame. He's unable to walk. And friends or family or whoever carry him to this spot daily. And he just simply asks from, the, from those who are entering the temple, for a little help. This man is not allowed inside the temple. Why? He's considered unfit. For him, a do not enter sign has been erected on the entrance. You're not welcome here. Keep off the grass, whatever. This man is right there. No divine encounter for you today. No atonement for your sins today. You're unworthy. Too bad. Have a nice day. See you tomorrow. Same time, same station, same old, same old. This was his lot in life. This is the way he spent each and every day. Is that not a horrible way to exist? What a horrible way to spend your days. And tragically, that's where millions of people are right now at this very moment. People sitting on the Syrian border. People sitting on the Texas border. People sitting at the corner of Guadalupe and Kingsbury. People beginning the day with little hope, with little possibilities. Some have small children with them. Others have aging parents with them. Many are desperate and alone. And just like the man, sitting beside the temple, sitting there beside a gate called the Beautiful Gate, they see, do not enter signs. They say, not welcome. As I thought about this story, and as I began to wonder, I began to wonder, as I thought about this story, I began to wonder, I want, do you think Peter and John knew this man? Do you think they knew who he was? I mean, after all, he had been coming to the same spot for years. He was somewhere around 40 years of age, and as far as we know, this is the way he was born. And so, this is basically all he's ever known. Did they know who he was? Had they seen him before? Did they know his background? It really doesn't matter. And I don't know what triggered their response that day. But we, re we read in Scripture how they stopped and they encountered that man on that particular day. I don't have any money to give you. I don't have any gold or silver to give you, but I've got something else. Get up. Stand up. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, get on your feet and walk. And I love this part. And here, let me help you. She didn't know I was going to do <laughs> He didn't just say, do it. He said, he actually helped him to his feet. I think what took place that moment 
What took place that day transcended a miraculous healing. And I do not discount at all that the man was healed physically. But the emotional healing that took place, the social barriers that were broken, the spiritual healing that took place was far greater. Get up. Those words were a game changer in that man's life that day. Get up. You see, up to that point, life consisted of appealing to the conscience of others for his daily needs. He had learned to live in the margins of society. He had learned to accept no for an answer. In 40 years, how many times do you think he heard no? How many times do you think he saw someone just look the other way so that they wouldn't have to stare at him? How many times? But when Peter told the man to get up that day, it was a signal there at the gate of the temple that old paradigms were beginning to crumble. It was a way of saying the ways of the past, the ways of looking at other people, the ways of treating one another are crumbling right before your eyes. For that man, his world changed. How do you think all of those that were witnessing the event, how do you think they thought about it? Now we know the sermon a couple of weeks ago, ago that one of the things that happened shortly after this, Peter couldn't keep his mouth shut. He started preaching and he wound up where? In jail. I don't know, you know, uh, if he intended that or not, but the world was changing right before their eyes. Peter spoke with authority. He spoke with the authority of Christ. Get up. Change your perspective. You, know, you are no longer confined to the spaces that are offered you by society. Peter was a game changer that day. My mom was a game changer in my life. And my mom was a game, game changer not only for me, but my brother and for many others as well. I had lots of friends in high school that liked to hang out at my house. I used to think it was because they liked me. I, was their bud. I just think they liked hanging out at my house because they liked the way my mom treated them. Many of you know game changers. And my guess is that many of you have been game changers yourself or someone along the way. Game changers all know the power behind those words that Peter used that day. Get up. Get up and move. Stand up. Walk. Dream. Hope. Believe. Today is a day we set aside to remember many of the game changers in our walk along the way. We call it Mother's Day. Let's hear it again. Can I hear a mother? Happy Mother's Day out there. Happy Mother's Day. Oh, y'all did good that time. But you know what? For some folks this morning, it's not Mother's Day, it's Valentine's Day. Say good morning, Valentine. Good morning. Friday morning, I got up and decided to kind of chill out for the morning. And my dear wife was puttering around and getting things going, and she said, hey, I'm headed to the shelter. Uh, and basically, I ran and grabbed my tennis shoes, and I said, hold on. <coughs> I'm going to go with you. I tagged along with Darlene that morning to the shelter, Friday morning. And uh, I helped walk dogs. I just helped walk some of the dogs that were in the kennels. And while they were cleaning out kennels, I would just take some of them and scratch them and hug them and remind them that, you know, there really were people in this world that had nice... Is that me? Yeah. I'm falling apart right here in front of you. <laughs> Some enchanted. Uh, I would just help doing some little things. Uh, I did my best to keep from crying when I would put some of the dogs back in the kennels. You know? I'm sorry, that's all the time I've got. Darlene scurried around cleaning kennels, filling up food bowls, and helping with all the other daily chores of the shelter. Now, one of the chores that I, I got to do on, on, on Friday morning was I got to sweep the cat room. I just want to say this, the cat room is overwhelming. 
There is absolutely no other way to describe it. And it's overwhelming, not so much in a real positive way either. Many wonderful, sweet, lovable cats of all sizes, shapes, and ages spend their days just hanging out there waiting. Just like the man at the temple, waiting for someone's charity, someone's kindness to make a difference in their day. And one of those cats is named Valentine. That's Valentine. Like Peter, and like my mom, Valentine is a game changer. She's a mom, and she has a kit all of her own that she tends to very lovingly. But Valentine is also nursing three other kittens that are not her own. There have been several kittens there that were abandoned for one reason or another, and they found a mom who was willing to take them in. While I was there, uh, someone brought in a little kitten that was, I don't know, just almost a newborn. And someone said, let's see if Valentine will accept her. And they took the kitten back to Valentine, and in a heartbeat, Valentine was immediately nuzzling that kitten, licking on it, cleaning of it, taking care of it. We have a word in the church for that. We call it unconditional love. Say those two words. Unconditional love. Love without conditions. Love without conditions. That little abandoned kitten now has a new mommy and a new family. And I pray one day that that little kitten will have a forever home, a place that it can be loved forever. What Valentine is doing at the shelter is what Peter did that day for that man. And it is what I am called to do. It is what you are called to do to make a difference in someone's life. How many Valentines have you had in your life? How many folks have you known on your journey who may not have been your biological mother, but played the role of a mom in your life? I've had a few, and some of them were actually men. Some were family members, others were teachers or friends. And no doubt, we've all played that role for someone ourselves. Some of you have been someone's Valentine. A mom may not be your real mom, but that doesn't matter. God will use each and every one of us. Indeed, today is a day that we've set aside and called Mother's Day. And I pray that if there's someone here this morning that has never experienced the sacrificial love of God that is so like that of a mother cat, willing to accept a lonely kitten that is not her own, to love and care for it. I hope that you'll know that love today. So many times we walk through life feeling as though we're alone, that there's no one that will go with us, that there's no one that cares. And I pray that you'll know that there's one who's already gone through the valley of the shadow for you. Today, tomorrow, perhaps a week from now, you may meet someone who needs for you to walk with them, to hold their hand, to confront uh, as they confront a, a, a worse fear. I pray you'll find the strength to take that hand, to be there. Remember this, when we celebrate moms, we celebrate the one who created moms. And we, when, when we celebrate sacrificial love, we celebrate the one who provided the greatest example. Get up and enjoy the day. For some, it's Mother's Day. And for some, it's Valentine's Day. But you know what? It's all good. It's all the same. And for that, I say to God, along be the glory.